Christina Vane is with us in Studio B, and uh, would you mind doing another song for me? No, not at all. Um, so I think I'll play one I wrote. It's called Wish and Bone Blues. Um, sorry, that was a half an I was thinking deep in thought already. Uh, I wrote this in, in California before I moved over to Nashville, and there's a lot of, of really light, fun things by the beach, but it's kind of a dark place where I was living, too, in Venice. There's, like, some interesting energy, and I hope that this song captured a little bit of that. WNCW live in Studio B, Christina Vane. Wishing Bone Blues, right? That's right. You know, yeah. both of the songs you've played today so far are ones that I've played on the air off the album, despite the, you know, they always give uh, focus tracks, you know, the songs. Totally. That, yeah. And, oh, good. That... And we love those, but we also love to go a little deeper into, the, and uh, you've you picked a couple of <laughs> really fine songs. All of the songs Thank on you. your new album, the new album, by the way, uh, Nowhere Sounds Lovely is all original music by Christina. Yeah, it is. Some um, serious writing time in this, I can oh, tell. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah, I. Um, that means a lot, first of all, because Wish and Moan Blues is one that definitely... On the record, I'm sure you heard it's got a lot of production and it's very cinematic and it, that's how I, I heard the song mm -hmm. when I wrote it. But it's uh, it's very different when you play it alone, you know, and the ones that are focused tracks are usually like the catchy, you know, ones right. that they assume most people are going to get into. But I was like, well, you know, when I have the floor, I want to play the ones that they might not hear. 
So it's cool that you're you're choosing to spin those. And, and I'm you, not the only one. I mean, I'm just oh, saying yeah, I, I cool. have personally, you know, and uh, I always find treasures, you know, going deeper into an album. Like you say, well, uh, someone decided, maybe the artist, maybe a record person or whatever decided the focus tracks. And, and they're all great. I mean, uh, but I do like to dig a little deeper. That that song to me, I listened to the words of it and I was like, you know, it just captured me. So oh, thank there you, you go. And it was nice to hear some of the story behind it as well. Yeah. The other thing that, you know, if, if people have any reference point for that song, it would be uh, actually, um, God, by Chris Whitley. So, you know, amazing slide player and played a resonator, you mm. know, rest in peace. He's not, he's not with us anymore, but... <laughs> His record Dirt Floor, which is a solo record, and he he does sometimes play the rec, uh, the resonator on like Scrapyard Lull Lullaby and some songs like that. But his playing style, that like bendy kind of thing, I hadn't ever explored that. And so that song came about when I had listened to a ton of that Dirt Floor record, and I was like, I want to do something like that. You know, he has this melancholy. Mm -hmm. beautiful songwriting style mm -hmm. so i think that seeped its way into the song yeah and truly hearing it today with just you and the resophonic gave it a, a different dimension it kind of gave it a different feel so thanks yeah, for doing that of one of course thanks for having me i noticed that cactus moser produced your record yeah, I love Cactus. He's a fine producer and also a great musician yeah he drummed on it too so did he oh yeah you know He's a jack of some trades, yeah, <laughs> but a lot of them. Well, he was somewhat the face of the band Highway 101 years ago, and that's why you know that's why his name comes back to me. And I'm always taken back to those days with, uh, with him and Highway 101. Uh, quite a character too. Such well, yeah. First of all, I need someone who can handle the Italian sass that my dad lovingly passed down to me. But also, <laughs> uh, and he's great. We like the banter. The energy was really high and great. And his, uh, you know, he basically got him and Winona and the Big Noise, the, the band that they tour with to do this record. So it's, you know, just excellent musicians and great people. Mm -hmm. But what I really like about Cactus and why I chose him to do this record is, especially the one he just did before I recorded this with Winona was because he comes from a rock background, and I do too, I wanted someone who could understand that, but then really dig deep into, you know, Appalachian references or the blues references or Hank Williams or any of those things that I was li listening to at the time that I wanted a little bit of that in the sound too. Mm -hmm. So Cactus was perfect because he knew when we just needed to rock out and, and get like heavy. And then he also knew when I wanted to do something really folky and, and more chilled out. So the record, I'm sure if you listen to it, is it's like a mountain range. It's got all these different things, got a banjo tune with just fiddle and then it's got a full rock song. And, mm -hmm. you know, so I, and that's how I want my music to be because I have a lot of influences and hopefully the people listening to it, you know, will like most of it, even if they don't like every single song on well, the record. So yeah. yeah. So he was perfect for this project. We love records like that because, um, it gives us an opportunity to maybe play it more often and have it fit into, you know, there's certain criteria when you're putting a mix together on the radio. It's not just random. So you're like, course, yeah. so yeah. So when you have a variety like that, you know, it'll fit in with this set of music and that set of music, you know, from the same record. And totally. I always think of uh, J.J. Kale when I get too worried about whether my sound is fitting into a box because I mean he has you know it's JJ Kale immediately but he does everything from like calypso songs to jazzy smooth jazz songs mm -hmm. to you know the songs that Skinner and, and Clapton covered and um he was I think largely also doing that to get those songs placed and being smart and business savvy but I think that what ties it all together is him and I'm hoping that you know that's what's going to happen with my music is that uh I am the main factor that brings it all together. <laughs> well, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Christina Vane with me here. Nowhere sounds lovely. Uh, any story behind the title of the of the album there? Yeah, it's um, if I had a, th a third instrument with me, which I'm just getting tired of lugging all four around. <laughs> I would play you the song that has the line "Nowhere sounds lovely" in it. It's on Traveling Blues, um, and the line is uh, "Onwards and upwards, this path leads to nowhere. Nowhere sounds lovely. I'd sure like to go there." And it, it's. Uh, isn't that deep, but it like it kind of is. When people ask me, like, oh, is it because I'm like, really, I just think that it can be interpreted either way. Nowhere sounds lovely, like no place sounds lovely, because uh, I'm not really from anywhere, and there has been a whole exercise of solving an identity crisis when I went on the tour where I wrote this record and, and uh, reconnecting with my American roots, because my father is American, um, 
And I just felt like I didn't have any claim to anything when I moved here. You know, I went to school for four years in the Northeast and then I went to LA, but I hadn't seen all the things that I personally believe make this country like great. You know, Mm -hmm. that whole, the nature to me is, is unparalleled. There's great things all over the world, but the just the diversity and, and the parks and these these things I'd never seen before and that's where a lot of this record came from so the nowhere sounds lovely really in that line it just means like wherever I go it's a joy well in that time I was writing it I was very inspired and, and you know traveling was was like oh we're going nowhere nowhere sounds lovely like sure like to go there because it didn't matter really I would go from place to place and meet new people, learn about the cultures of that place, stay with them, and Mm -hmm. then camp usually. I had a much lighter schedule three years ago, so I was filling a lot of days in the parks. And um, yeah, and so Nowhere Sounds Lovely is kind of like my, uh, I'm tired of answering people where I'm from, I'm tired of telling them where I'm going or what my favorite place is. Like, (laughs) it's all great, you know what I mean? If If you make it. You're almost, you're almost saying anywhere sounds lovely. Totally. There's a lot of ways to interpret that, yeah. which is why, you know, the cover of the record is on, Ven- on Venice Beach, where I lived the day before I drove out to Nashville permanently to move. That picture was taken and then on a whim by my excellent photographer friend. And then the photo on the back is me in Nashville, and it's like supposed to be sort of. And then the middle photos, I actually took myself on a film camera, and those are the Dakotas, mm-hmm. which is another big, you know, part of my. Love you have, tr- like the song is, you've truly been everywhere, haven't you? <laughs> uh, uh, there's uh, a few spots I've missed. I don't think I've, uh, some of those middle states and then like Maine and those, the Northeast is, mm-hmm. is tough because if you don't get there in the summer, you just, I don't really want to go up there in December. <laughs> but um, yeah, I'll get there eventually. I'm trying my best to cover this wide country. Is this your first visit to North Carolina? No. Oh, okay. No. Uh, and North Carolina seeped into one of my songs on the record too, Um on a satisfied soul, I like, oh, the rain falls so fine up in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And then I would sit in, I was in Asheville for a week with the kind help of some friends that put me up in an extra room they had. So it was a really peaceful week. And every day at 4 p.m. was like a monsoon. Yeah. I don't know how you guys do it. But, yeah. Well. <laughs> but it was really nice. I do know how you guys do it. I mean, in, the, in a way, it was really nice. Like the heat breaks and then you like have this beautiful sun come out and it's like a rainforest almost. So. Yeah, I love Asheville, but I love North Carolina in general. You know, I mean, the Carolinas are beautiful. I love but Charleston. You're yeah. pretty much basing out of Nashville these days, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. Tennessee's got some beautiful vistas as well. Oh, yeah. When I first moved there, I'm, I'm ashamed to say my uh, perspective and attitude weren't the best. I was really missing the things I knew, and I was like, why did I do this? And for a, a full year, you know, it didn't help that I moved in the winter, which was a, a silly idea. But even when the summer came around, I was like, it's so hot. How do people live here? I don't understand. <laughs> it's so wet. The bugs, the chiggers, I can't. Um, and now, you know, I, was, I called my friend who's born and raised in Tennessee on the drive here. And I was like, I just think it's so funny. I was driving out this morning at 7 with the fog lifting over the Smokies. And I was like, it's so beautiful here. I love Tennessee. Oh, my God. So, you know, I think it's an attitude perspective shift for me. But, I, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of Tennessee. I moved there for the music, though, really. Yeah. Definitely. Originally. And you know, it's and, and it's not just Nashville and Memphis, it's the music, you know, in East Tennessee, too. There's oh, so yeah. much, the you know. Banjo stuff, especially, that culture is really Sure. Cool. We, we, our signal covers a pretty broad area, and part of that, part of what I call our listening region, you know, is the Johnson City, Kingsport, Bristol, great. you know, that, yeah, totally. that section there, and uh, a lot of great music out of there, and Knoxville, and mm-hmm. everything, which is all kind of within reach of our signal, so uh, we like to claim that as a part of the WNCW listening region. So. Well, I'm, I'm claiming you guys, too, if you're listening out there. <laughs> Go Tennessee! It's such a pleasure to have you today. Um, uh, Christina Vane here in Studio B. Oh, I'm so sorry. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> I hit the mic. All that was me. I'm getting my banjo. That's why. I have a good excuse. Well, that's right. She's grabbing the banjo, which is on the other side of her. That's right. She only has one banjo, unlike Bela Fleck, who will come out on stage with like eight, <laughs> you know. I mean, I was, uh, so, you know, I'm here to play the Travis Book Happy Hour tonight. And then yeah. um, opening for Town Mountain on Saturday at the Salvage Station. And uh, between those two shows and last night's show, I had uh, four instruments with me yesterday. And I'm starting to be like... I better be able to back this up. That's a big statement to come to a stage with four. And I could bring more. Like, if I could have, I would have brought five to have my acoustic guitar, too. But sure. 
it start. I don't have a roadie. I'm not quite there yet. Oh, you know? okay, okay. Well, I got a little. I was, all, I was on the air. I would have helped you. You know, come <laughs> bring them on. Oh in. no, I mean everyone I work with are super help. They, you know, like Travis helped me bring some stuff. He's in great here. to work with, isn't he? He's super nice. Yeah, what a, what a nice guy. Um, yeah. What but, a band they are, man. Oh, truly, my. Yeah. monster. You know, and I didn't see the Bill Monroe tribute coming, and and that really shocked me in a way. You know, when we were talking about doing this show, and he reached out. Um, I, I warned him. I was like, hey, just so you know, I don't want to be weird, but I'm really new to the, the jam grass scene especially. Like the bluegrass, I've had a few years now to, but I like the trad stuff a lot, you know? Mm-hmm. And he was like, oh, well, do you like, uh, you know, Tony Rice? And I was like, hm, you want to sing some Tony Rice? So <laughs> uh, so tonight we're singing some, some acapella, to, like Skaggs and Rice stuff. Wow. And, um, that's like one of my favorite records uh, ever, probably, you know? And it's really cool to see that side, like the, a, a, how do I say, an innovator in the genre that has done so much for modern bluegrass to mm. like still revere someone that I, as a new learner, am like, that's a classic, you know, Tony Rice and all that stuff, and Bill Monroe especially. i a huge fan of Bill Monroe. So yeah, well, that's good that to record's hear. awesome, yeah. It's good to hear. And how hard was it learning the Clawhammer banjo? You said you learned that at McCabe's. It was hard. It was really hard. You have to undo a lot of, like, guitar hand. And um, I was learning Travis picking at the time, too, so the thumb being on the top string was so hard for me to get used to. So on Clawhammer banjo... Uh, if that's not obvious to someone listening, there's this little, on any banjo, there's a little string at the top, um, and it's shorter than the rest, and your thumb, when you play clawhammer, just like, lives there, and it bounces, but when I was learning, you know, I wanted to go down and do stuff, so <laughs> yeah. it took a while, but you just gotta sit down and uh, yeah, I've, struggle I've through just, it. When I watch people play clawhammer, I mean, even the modern artists like Becky Buller and some of these other folks that play it, I, I'm just like... Amazed, Tony <laughs> Tony Mabe, he's in uh, um, Junior Six Sisk's band, and yeah, but but yeah. when you watch the masters like String and Grandpa and and all those guys, you know, and I'm like, how do they get a melody out of that? Well, especially yeah, I mean, I think his style was like really fast, too, mm-hmm. you know, String the uh, and or and or um, yeah, no, that's who I'm thinking of because some of his recordings of like you know Mountain Dew and stuff, it's Clawhammer, but, and same with Ralph Stanley, he plays like that too. Yeah, Ralph. Age, yeah. He was like. It's like so much faster. I play a very melodic <laughs> comparatively just because I learned by myself, like mm-hmm. almost in a vacuum. And I went to a few old time jams in Los Angeles, but no one was teaching me what style of banjo to play. And only now am I really delving into the Round Peak heroes. I mean, I knew about them all by name and I had listened to their stuff, but I'm finally got a, my hands on a book that like is going to teach me who I play like because I don't really know. Um, but... It's, you know, I think that when I see three finger style players now, I'm like, oh, this is so natural. How do they do that stuff? So <laughs> it never ends. It's just a constant learning curve. Well, I, you know, I thought about learning the banjo when I was younger and I never did. And, uh, but the, I'm like, you can't, you, you can learn some things about guitar and three finger banjo by watching guys play. Mm-hmm. I don't know how anybody would learn anything about playing claw hammer from watching a claw hammer player. Yeah, it's tricky. And and there's so many different approaches, right? Because with Clawhammer, with anything, but with Clawhammer specifically, you know, there's this rhythm. Mm. And you can you can get out of that rhythm and you're really technically adept and play every note in a melody, but a lot of people would argue that that's actually not even the function of the instrument in mm. that in that, you know, capacity. Like mm. you might might like to do that and that's totally fine, but when some people would argue they just want to hear a simpler part. Mm-hmm. And that's like that balance that's hard to find sometimes as a claw hammer player in a jam situation or even recording a tune that you like with someone. It's like, how far do I go with this? You know, do I work out every single note and make it really like technically proficient or do I play the song, you know, in a, right. in a broader sense? So it's been a fun journey to learn all that stuff. 